in August of the year 461, at Patavium, Oreste learns that Majoran was obliged to abdicate by the troops revolted in the camp of Tortona at the foot of the Alps. He explains to his wife, the patrician Rissima was not satisfied with the strengthening of the power and prestige of the emperor. In addition, Majorian's reforms and his fight against the abuses triggered the irritation of the majority of officials and offices. How narrow-minded people are, by defending their small personal interests. They do not see that the empire can perish very quickly. Agidius, master general of Gaul, openly accuses Rissima of the murder of Majorian and refuses to recognize Severus, a new puppet emperor. With the support of his army and the Franks, he proclaims the independence of Gaul. General Marcellin, with his army and his fleet, left Sicily, seizes Dalmatia, and declares himself the Patricius of the West. Set in a chair by the vaulted fireplace, Orestes reads a letter from Nepotanius, a former master of the militia of Majorian, who asks him to help his brother Marcellin to win over the nobility of Pannonia and to engage in his army of Huns mercenaries. Julia enters the room quickly and says with a smile, Good Lord, it's a happy day for us. Astounded, Orestes glances at his wife and replies with great bitterness in his voice, Nothing can please me any more. The state is decomposing. The situation is getting worse every day. It is impossible for me to serve the Emperor Severus, the Patricius Rissima, a Majorian murderer, and it is not prudent to help Marcellin. As my friend Nepotanius asks me in this letter, I want to remain neutral in our nest but I have no serious pretext to refuse a direct proposal. You have a very serious pretext now, exclaimed Julia. God has finally heard my prayers. Orestes looks attentively at his wife, radiant with joy, and slowly rises, you mean that. Now when we have lost all hope, you think, yes, my dear fellow, I'm waiting for a baby. Our doctor has just confirmed this. Orestes kisses his wife against her heart, tenderly caresses her hair. What a happy day for us. What happiness. Orestes gives his son, born in the spring of 462, the name of Romulus, in memory of his father-in-law. Absorbed by his struggle against the Vandals and by the attempts to subdue the Gaulish and Dalmatian separatists, Rissima left calm the Pannonia and Orestes felt almost independent in his properties. The use of the hitch with the shoulder collar greatly facilitates agricultural work. Under the pretext of defending the borders, he reinforces his private militia, composed of Huns and stops paying taxes, but many other proprietors are ruined by the incursions of the barbarians and flee the country which has become too dangerous. Orestes keeps friendly relations with Edicon, who has become king and visits him often. Then Julia, who has regained the joy of living after the birth of her son, listens with pleasure to the memories of old friends. Orestes also maintains good neighborly relations with the three brothers, Valamir, Vidimir and Thuidimir, kings of the Ostrogoths. But the relations between the Germanic peoples of the Danube are very complicated. Rissima finally acknowledges his impotence. He eliminates his Severus puppet and begins negotiations with Eastern Emperor Leo. In April 467, Emperor Leo appoints Anthanius, son-in-law of his predecessor Martian, as Emperor of the West, and sent him to Rome, accompanied by counselors and with an army. Orestes and Julia then decides to visit Rome with the little five-year-old Romulus to see the changes that may be important for their son's future. 
Julia's mother is delighted to see them and offers them to stay in Rome for a month to show her little son the curiosities and amusements of the capital and then to rest in his villa in the country. A few days later, they attend the wedding of Rissima with the daughter of Anthemius celebrated with the great joy because it is believed that this union will guarantee the public safety. The people dance and sing in all theatres, markets, public squares, temples, gymnasiums, suspend and postpone all affairs. Hope is reborn in the hearts of the Romans. They are beginning to speak of a new expedition against the Vandals, this time with the help of the army of the Eastern Empire. Orestes does not seek contact among the influential people of the capital but does not refuse invitations because the news and the state of public opinion interest him. He is everywhere received with respect. Thus, Avienus, a senator, who accompanied Pope Leo for the negotiations with Attila, says to him, I remember with great pleasure the diplomatic dinner given for us by Attila. I was struck by his kindness with us, the vanquished. Then he smiles, he was shocked, in my opinion. That Pope Leo does not speak Greek. Yes. Attila liked to speak this language and he often read legal, political and even philosophical texts. He preferred to speak with wonders in Greek. Avienus lowers his voice. Today, after eleven years of the regency of Patricius Rissima, of Swabi's origin, I am sure that Attila could realize the union between the Romans and the Huns and ensure the rebirth of our civilization under his enlightened and powerful protection. A young man, about 30 years old, approaches and salutes them respectfully. Avienus exclaims loudly, I am delighted to receive in my house such celebrities as Orestes. Minister and General of Attila and close collaborator of Majorian and Sidonius, a poet whose bronze statue decorates the Forum of Trajan. The crowd of its customers who surround them welcomes this declaration with applause. When Avientus goes away, Orestes says, I cannot sincerely declare myself a great admirer of your poetry. But I have appreciated your verses on Majoran. He rallies his squadrons and laughs at the cold, for in him alone the warmth of the heart prevails. Flattered, Sodoin responds with the conventional modesty of an aristocrat, I have tried, by my feeble songs, to express my sentiments for this exceptional emperor. But instead of a compliment, equally conventional, normally provoked by this feigned modesty, he hears, no doubt you will now begin to write a panegyric of Anthemius. The poet is astonished. How did you guess? Indeed, Senator Basilius advises me to write a poem for the emperor's upcoming elevation to the consulate. The war against the Vandals begin well but eventually turns into disaster through the fault of Basiliscus, commander of the allied troops, brother of the empress Foran. This expedition, which cost the taxpayers more than 130,000 pounds of gold, is accompanied by a levy of additional taxes, fines and confiscations. After this disaster, Rissima cannot stand being relegated to the second rank, he leaves Rome and settles in Milan. He strengthens his connections with the Bergens, of whom the king is husband of his sister and with the Suvis, established in Noricum and Pannonia. Thus Italy is divided into two hostile kingdoms. Soon begins a ruinous civil war which ends with the siege and bag of Rome. The emperor Anthemius was massacred on his throne by the soldiers of his son-in-law. He is replaced by Olibrius, a new puppet by Rissima, son-in-law of Emperor Valentinian III. Four days later, Rissima died of a short and painful illness. He is replaced by his nephew Gundabald, king of the Bergens. Olibrius died, in his turn, only a few months after the patrician Rissima. Gundabald proclaimed Emperor Glycerius, one of his servants.